Hey everyone and welcome back to the workbench and uh, I hope you'll excuse this unboxing. The reason for it is I haven't bought a Halgen locomotive for some time and uh, I've just uh, purchased this Halgen Class 45 from Rails of Sheffield. I had one of their flash sales making it oh so tempting and I gave in but I've noticed there's some differences from previous Halgen models uh, not only in the packing uh, but also the supplied accessories and uh, the way the loco is packed so I thought I'd share that with you as well. Okay so the box is slightly lighter than usual from Halgen and there's a bit of a, a kink there but it doesn't affect it. Let's get in. One of the things I wanted to run through with you, with you is the new manual that all the manufacturers now seem to be doing. I do like them, much better you get a little booklet with some good class history that we'll go through. Really good. And then you've got an exploding diagram of all the spare parts that are available, always looks scary. And then some details of how the model will work, how your lighting goes, and then a reference to a magic wand to turn the cab lights on and off. So that's going to be new for me. And then just a general bit of information about it on the back. So if we take the box out, uh, take the loco out of the box, it's nicely packed with the ice cube packing. And we're expecting to see a lovely, beautiful, sleek class 45 in there, and I'm sure we won't be disappointed. But here we are, look. There's the magnetic magic wand for turning the cab lights on and off. Usual sort of accessory pack. I know there's some sandboxes in there that were on the inner parts of the bogies um, for the earlier models. But I think after the 70s they were taken off. Same as well, we've got a steam heating pipe there. But that won't be fitted because this is going to be a sort of a 1970s, 1980s model. So let's just open it up. Excuse the very untidy workbench, but so many exciting things going on, getting ready to bring you in the near future. And straight away, we've got the model, and you can see the detail in that fan there. It's pretty good, apart from there's a bit of tape with a black and red wire in the top there. Yeah, so it might need to be altered. Oil stains there, but that you know, happens with all of them. So out she comes. And you think you're away that you've got this packing device and it appears to be screwed on which is great for holding the model still during transit you can see there's the socket for it but i do wonder what it will be like when you just want to put the model away yourself i don't want to have to keep putting that on and off anyway so appears to be two screws i will whip them out and we'll see what we've got okay so the screws were partly removed. I think um, there's a little tip if Halgen were listening is um, set the torque a little bit lower on your screwdriver guys. You don't need to do that up quite so tight. It's a nightmare to undo. We've got immediately under the battery box there we've got some nice detail and she is free of her packing. And there's the packing device taken off the loco. And you've got screws with little washers and everything. A great idea as I say to keep things safe during transit which is obviously where a lot of the damage can occur. She's clearly been lubricated because she's got a little bit of lubricant on the roof. And this is our first look at her. And you can see they've fitted some of the front end detail which is great because I hate doing that. And also see we've got the Pony wheel, nicely and free to move. Um, ooh, another oil patch there. Look, got a little bit of up and down pivot in the bogey. Absolutely brilliant because that means if you've got any unevenness in your track, that will uh, account for that. I'm just going to clean off all the oil bits and I'll come back. So the oily bits have been cleaned off, and we're just having a look at some of the fine details. The tops panel under the number there is absolutely perfectly legible which is really nice and the Sherwood Forester name nicely done as well. 
I mean, look at the details here. It's certainly nice. I'm not disappointed so far, guys. Here's the model on the test track for now. And something I've picked up is the cabs are absolutely spectacularly de detailed. Um, and I'm hoping that the cab lighting will do a good job at showing that up. But I suppose we ought to test and see if she runs. Uh, she's quite happy. Needs a run in, of course. This is just fresh out of the box. You've opened the box with me, so you know that. I think a bit of rolling road might be nice to see if these lights work. I mean, I don't know if you can see that. Um, we've got the marker lights on the front, sealed beam marker lights, correct for a loco of this age. And the cab lights are on, but they're not super bright. But you don't really want them super bright because in reality, they were just 40 watt bulbs. Believe me, I know. There's the magic wand. Let's we'll see if you can see a difference when I pass it over the top. So I've gone out now, and then I'll bring it back. I think I can... There we go, we go back on. <laughs> Must be a reed switch in there. Just, just change the angle of the camera, I think we can do that. Right, so we're looking through the side window now. Nice drop light window. So let's try the old magic wand. There we go. You see the lights? going on and off. I like that. Um, some models have the cab lights on all the time and it looks pretty rubbish really because the driver at night couldn't see out if the cab lights were on. Let's see if we can get some close-ups of the cab. Being a very long wheelbase model, there was always going to be tight spots on less than second radius curves, but I found the model was squeaking and slowing down excessively on my second radius curves. The solution was actually quite simple, so here it is. Under the front of the bogies is a little peg for height control. This needs to be lubricated with some kind of light grease, so it can slide easily on the underside of the chassis. Also the front pony truck needs to be slightly loosened off. Only about half a turn of the screw and a good quality PTFE based oil like Labelle 102 put down both sides of the screw so the plates can slide easily. This has certainly helped the loco get round the tighter curves. First up is class 45113 that I saw at Bristol in 1984. She returned to the depot and I got another chance to take some photos. I also have my tape recorder with me, so let's have a listen to her in action. The next two photos are of a class 45 on the down through road at Haven. The year must have been 1981 and I'd seen the loco and train heading past on the upline to Chidester. My friend worked in Emsworth overlooking the railway line and he tipped me off when the loco came through heading for Haven, resulting in these snaps taken on my boots Tele 110 camera. 
I'm sure I've got the number somewhere in my album. I'll have to dig it out, unless anyone can see it. Haven't again for these two snaps, but this time a Class 46 with brush electrical gear. The train was the Manchester to Portsmouth service in the evenings, and it is seen near Denville's Bridge, approaching Haven't Junction. Seven Tunnel Junction and Bristol in 1984 now, with a Class 45 and 46011, followed by 45059 and another back at Bristol. To finish this section we have peaks in London at St Pancras Station. How things have changed, and not for the better I'd say. Hope you enjoyed this section. I always like the peaks, rare visitors to us on the south coast of course. Coming up we get back to the Halgen model and some tests on the layout. There had been a lot of activity in the yard recently. Walls had been pared back and pinch points painted red and the foreman, angry or otherwise, seemed particularly on edge. It transpired that a new and valuable freight flow from the Midland region could be coming to the yard, but first the traction that would work the train throughout needed to be gauge tested to make sure it could gain access to the sidings. Before this loco arrives we need to wait for the 2pm staff train to clear the yard. Our loco arrives in the form of 45060 named Sherwood Forester. With one Coco one bogies it's no wonder it needs to be gauge and clearance checked. First the tight crossover is carefully but successfully negotiated. After suitable advice and don't break my new siding warnings from the foreman, the 45 gingerly tries to get down siding number 2. It's incredibly tight with lots of flange friction, a shame as this was the preferred siding for the job. So the 45 is tried with more success on the dairy siding, which does still afford access to the road crane, which is all important. With the test a success, just, the crew of the 45 are invited for lunch at the good shed, if they can squeeze their loco down there of course. Fortunately they just about make it, and the 45 enjoys a rest, while the crew refresh themselves for the trip back to the Midland. 
all too soon it's time to go and the 45 leaves the good shed road and heads off into the sunset so despite the long wheelbase the Helgen 45 does manage these curves we'll say that the Backman class 45 manages these curves with no problems at all um, it's got more flexibility but uh, this is not bad for something that is really attempted to be as um, prototypical as possible they had a route availability of 7 which uh, wasn't that great anyway the only niggle I've got is that the cab lights flicker well before the loco stops and they flicker quite badly and of course we can turn them off so it's not too much of a problem front couplings not sure I'm going to fit them, I might just have to have a bar over the buffer beam because I do like the details and that means I can fit the uh, false hook as well. Anyway, you'll see this loco again soon, hopefully employed on the new freight flow to the Goodshard. <laughs>